So we're in week two of this new series called Timeline, and I feel like we just want to set this time aside, committed to the Lord in prayer right now as we get ready to go into week two. Let's bow our heads as we just pray and ask God just to speak into our hearts. Father, we just thank you right now for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your word speaks life into us, Father God. I pray that as we share the word this morning, Lord, there'd be clear understanding. Father, I thank you that your word always brings revelation, brings understanding, brings peace and hope into our spirits, Father. Pray right now that as I speak the word, that your spirit would be attached to it. I thank you that you would tailor make this word right now, this message this morning, for each and every individual in this room. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in week two of a series called Timeline, and last week we've been, we started it's the series. We've been speaking about uh, living in the end times and living, being ready for, the, for things uh, that are happening right now in our life. And I really believe we're living in times like we've lived in no other times before in human history with so many things that are, are taking place in around life, with all the events that are taking place on a global scale, even locally in our own country and, and just across our borders and in, over international waters. There, we're living in times that I believe that no human history has ever experienced and and so what I want to say is when we speak about the end times people get fretful they get fearful as the, as the people trying to avoid the conversation really don't want to we don't want to make anybody fearful or fretful around that um, but what we need to know is that we are living in different times in unique times and and so we we're going into week two next week I'll be finishing up the series and I really believe that next week is my favorite part of the series we're going to be speaking about how God wants to reward each and every single one of us and what our rewards will look like and and just living for him that God is a reward of those who diligently seek him and so it's going to be exciting if you want to know how to get rewarded in in, in eternity you want to be here next week Sunday know the life that God wants you to live in and so like I said this the series is not the, the purpose of the series is not to create fear not to create anxiety or think people like oh man what what's going to happen to me no it's not it's not it's not that at all. It's really just preparing us to be ready for Jesus and the return of Jesus, re ready to meet him. Because this is what we know, is that we are going to meet him, whether, in, whether he comes down now or whether we go on and die and pass away to be with him. We're all going to meet Jesus. And what's the common thing that we all want to know is that we're all ready for him. Amen. We want to be ready to meet our creator. And so, um, so for the church, I really believe for the church, this is the greatest hour that we live in it. I really believe we live in exciting times, so much happening around us, but it's the greatest hour. It's not a time for you and I when we see what's happening on the news, when we see what's happening in the world, we see all of the devastation that goes on and the evil that's happening. It's not nice to see that, but for you and I, it's not a time to be scared. It's a time to be excited because the Bible teaches when we see those things, we know that the season is coming. Okay, so, so it's a time for you and I to be full of faith. Full of excitement, full of anticipation for what God is doing. Because look what it says in Luke chapter 18. Jesus is speaking. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So what God is saying is that when I come back, when he comes back to collect us, he doesn't want us to be hiding in shelters. He doesn't want us to be running away from life. He wants us to be full of faith. Believing more than ever before that he's the God of the impossible. Believing more than before that he can do miraculous things. Believing more than before that, that the same miracles that happen in the book of Acts can happen in the 21st century. We've got to be living, living full of faith, expecting him to do what he wants to do. And, and so what we said is that, because when we speak about uh, the end times and we speak about the times that we're living in and people can understand that maybe we are close to the second coming of Christ that generally what people do is they go a little bit weird and so we, we don't want that to happen at all we don't want you to go and cash in your provident fund and spend everything you have because I said Jesus is coming I said Jesus is coming I did not give you a date I did not give you a time anybody who gives you a date and gives you a time you need to pray for them because they missed it and um, so please don't do that we don't want to do any of that we want to this is what we want to do we want to plan like a plan plan our lives like he's not coming in our lifetime but we want to live like he's coming tomorrow okay and so when we do that we'll be ready for him okay look what Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24 25 two chapters of the Bible where Jesus is speaking two of many chapters in the Bible where Jesus speaks about his return and coming back to earth look what he says in Matthew 24 no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. 
And then he goes on and he says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is how it will be when the Son of Man comes. So Jesus is saying, people are just going to be living freely. Like, ah, oh, Jesus is not coming. There's no end to the world. We're going to die one day, and who knows what happens afterwards. Jesus is saying, don't live like that. That's how it was in the day of Noah. You know that it's interesting to know that Noah preached the gospel for a hundred years while he built the boat. Not one person got saved. Because everybody thought, it's just joking. What is he talking about? You know that in our world that we're living in today, there are people who think that this is just a myth. But God's word teaches us over and over that he is coming back again, that the world is going to come to an end, and he's going to create a new heaven, a new earth, and you and I who are Christ followers, those of us that have been born again, we are going to enjoy that new heaven, we're going to enjoy that new earth, we're going to be the ones that rule and reign in the age to come, you might feel like you're not ruling and reigning now, but you keep following Christ, you keep living for Christ, I'm telling you now, the end is going to come, and when we come down with Christ again, we are going to rule and reign no more anger no more hate no more war no more sickness no more disease only peace joy love prosperity healing all those things when Jesus comes back again and so we want to be prepared so look what he says so you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming so Jesus saying keep watch because you don't know what day the Lord is coming it reminds me of this joke I came across this joke about this group of people they were doing a conversation and, and they were busy having this conversation and they were talking about life and, and the one person popped up in the conversation and said um, what would you do if the unlikely event that and the possibility that you were going to die in four weeks and everybody started to think and like wow that could be a reality that could happen that could be something that happens to people as they go on in life and so so what happened is this one guy got up and he said you know if I knew that I was going to die in four weeks I would do everything 24 hours a day I would do my best to go and tell people about Jesus get as many people born again get as many people into the kingdom of God and and, and everybody looked at him and said man that is an amazing thing that you can do absolutely as they were we agree 100% at the second person a lady jumps up and she says if I knew I was going to die in four weeks what I would do is I'd start serving I'd start serving God more I'd start preparing myself to serve God. I'd start serving my family more, my husband more. I'd start serving in the church more. I'd start serving people in my, in my world at work. I'd just, be a, I'd just become a servant to them. And everybody agreed and said, man, that is so admirable. That is awesome. And then this guy in the back of the room, he got up and he said, if I knew Jesus was coming, I was going to die in four weeks. He says, if I knew I was, I was going to die in four weeks, uh, this is what I'd do. I'd go live with my mother-in-law. And everybody was puzzled and they looked at him and they said, why would you go live with your mother-in-law? And he said, because it would be the longest four weeks of my life. <laughs> we never know. And so Peter comes along and he, Peter, great apostle, church builder, he comes in 2 Peter chapter 3. Look what he says. But do not forget this one thing. So he wants us to pay close attention. He says, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, meaning that God wants us to, to be ready, get ready for his return. Look what he says, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I want to stop there and say this, that it's not God's will that people would perish. It's not God's will that people would go through the suffering and go through pain and be disconnected from him. It's God's will that people would have relationship with him. God loves the world for God so loved the world. Let me just say this, God loves you this morning. Do you know that God loves the people you love this morning? And God loves the people you don't love this morning. God loves the world. And he doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anybody to be disconnected from him. He says he's not slow, but he wants everybody uh, not to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The word repentance simply means this, to change your mind. To have a change of mind, to have a change of direction. God wants us to do that. He wants to live with these, this mindset that, that, we, that he doesn't want anyone to perish. Look what it says in verses 10. But the day of the Lord, this is Peter speaking now, will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid there, laid bare. 
Look what he goes on. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way. So what he's saying is, understand what's going to happen. Because of this, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. So what Peter is saying right there, God is saying in our word, is that how do we prepare ourselves to meet Christ? How do we prepare ourselves for the second coming or when Jesus comes? How do we do that? We ought to live holy lives. And this morning, I want to encourage us, let's be aware of the times we're living in, but let's be focused on the way we live in. Because we can be so focused on the times that we lose focus on the way we live in. And so we want to do that. We want to be focused on that. In the Jewish calendar, if you, you know, there's a thing called the seven day, the Jewish seven day theory. Uh, something you can research. It's the Jewish seven day theory. And uh, it talks about um, one day as a thousand days to the Lord and a thousand days as a uh, thousand years as one day to the Lord. And the whole concept of this theory is that, um, that everything is going to reflect the nature of Christ, and it says here, it talks about where the extent of human history, the seven-day theory talks about the extent of human history will reflect creation. And the creation story is made up of seven days. Six days God worked, seventh day God's rested. And so what happened is, according to the Jewish calendar, if you look at the Jewish calendar, what they believe is that right now we're on the 6,000-year mark, and anything can happen after that 6,000 year mark. So just looking at that calendar, but how many of you know we don't, we don't go weird and we don't go sci-fi. We just be aware of the times, amen? Because 1 Chronicles 12 says this, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So while we're living in this place, while we know that the season is drawing close, what we need to do is we need to understand the times and we need to know the direction that we take in our lives. That's why Peter says, in this time, time you ought to live holy and godly lives and so that's what we want to do we want to focus on becoming more like Christ and so while we be living on this earth we see the signs in this generation what makes this generation so unique to any other generation is that we're experiencing all of these things at simultaneously or at times that are of close intervals and so we want to be ready and so this morning I want to talk a little bit just for the few moments on times and seasons and times and seasons. Ecclesiastes is our passage we're going to read from. It says, for everything there is a season. Everything there is a season. A time for every activity under the sun. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. And as you read that passage, you'll see that there is a time for a lot of things that take place in our life. And in scripture, whenever we see the word time and seasons, we need to know that they have two different meanings. Time is different to seasons. Those seasons are made up of time, and time makes up a season. They are two different things. They're very unique. Time is referred to as a situation, an incident, moments, things that we face, things that happen under the sun. Time is everything that happens under the sun. Seasons are spiritual. Seasons are things that happen above the sun. Seasons are things that God has implemented. You see, there's two words when we talk about time. There's two words in, two words in the Greek that refer to time. The first word is the word chronos, which is where we get the word chronological time. It's where we get the word time. It refers to clock time, that time is measured. That time is measurable. And time, as, as long as we're living in time and as we're living under the sun, we're going to be measured by the things that we do under the sun. Amen. This is what we know is that success is measured by time. Life is measured by time. People, when you go to the tombstone of somebody, you'll see the time that they lived, the years that they lived. Everything is measured under the sun in time. In sports, time is critical. In actual fact, athletes are made champions through time because of time. Okay. And so Teams win games based on time. You can win a game or lose a game in the last minute. Time is important. It's imperative. Amen. Kronos, meaning the time that we live under the sun, is where we live. This is where life happens. This is where we experience everything that happens under the sun. In time we sow. In time we reap. 
in time we laugh, in time we cry. Everything happens on, on this earth that is happening to us right now while we live in life is time. It's called chronos. We make decisions in time. What kind of a house you're going to buy? What time of kind of a career you're going to choose? What kind of life partner you're going to choose? Marry? You make decisions on how many children you're going to have. We make all of these decisions in time, and time is important to us, and we need to make the best of every time. And that's why Paul goes on in Ephesians 5, and he says, make the best use of the time. Make the best use of the time because the days of evil. The days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know what is so amazing? That there's not many things in life that are equal. Like, you know, we're all born into different families. We're all born into different races. We're all born into different systems. But you know what? One thing that is equal for each and every single one of us is time. Is that we all get 24 hours a day that we can live out our lives. Time is equal. And how we use time and how we use, uh, apply time in our life is going to impact our life. And Paul is saying, use our time well. Because how many of you know the days around us are not so bright? We've got to use them because the days are evil. And that's why he goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 26. He says this, So I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step I fight to win. So what Paul is saying, every step I take, every move I make, I do it with purpose. I do it with purpose because everything around us is about to change because there's a time for sowing, there's a time for reaping. Everything changes in time. And so he's saying, while I'm living under the sun, listen, church, I want to encourage us, while we're living under the sun, we've got to live with purpose. We've got to make sure that every step we take has a purpose behind it. Every relationship we build, there's a purpose behind it. They've got to live with the sense of purpose in our life. Why? Because under the, when the, while, as we're living under the sun, I can tell you now, we're going to face different situations, different circumstances, different moments in our life. And if we're not living with purpose, those incidents and situations can overcome us. But when we're living with purpose, intention, and we go through life, and we face those storms in life or situations in life, when we're living with purpose, not only are we able to overcome them, but we realize that God can use what happens in time for His glory that can impact more than our lives. Amen. And so we want to live with time. We, want to, we realize that we're living in Kronos. We, and what Paul is saying, while we live in time, we need to fight to win. Now let me just say this. We don't need to fight for our salvation. God has saved us. We don't have to fight for God to come and redeem us. He has already redeemed us. But what we've got to fight is we've got to fight the enemy that's trying to steal in the time that we live in. And so Kronos is the first word in the Greek that refers to time, chronological order. The second word is the word kairos. Kairos is, speaks about an appointed time, speaks about a due season that's to come, speaks about seasons in our life. Seasons happen above the clouds. Time happens here, but seasons happen above the clouds. Seasons is the spiritual aspect of our life. It speaks of eternity. Season speaks about a, a future that's never going to end. And you know what is so awesome is that only man can comprehend eternity. The Bible says God has put eternity in the heart of every man. This is what I know, is that many people will deny eternity, but if you notice when someone's on their deathbed, what is the conversation like? I wonder where I'm going. Why do we ask those questions when we think about the end, when we think about our life? We ask those questions because God has deposited eternity in the heart of every single man. God has not deposited eternity into nature. He's only deposited it into man. Dogs understand time. Men understand eternity. Dogs know what time their master's coming home. Dogs know what time to do what they need to do. Amen. But how many of you know God has deposited eternity in each and every single one of our hearts? We need to be prepared. Dog knows what time they need to eat. They know everything. But seasons happen above the clouds. The best way that I can explain this is that, that while we're living in time, bad things can happen. 
Like we can experience loss, we can experience pain. And so what happens is if we're just focused on chronos, time, and not thinking that there's kairos, seasons, that things above the clouds, what starts to happen is we only live for the chronos, we only live for the time and we get discouraged. Because here's what happens, the enemy wants you to think that things are not working out well. Because you can have a bad day in time, but be living in a good season. And so what happens in our life, we, we're like pushing forward, pushing forward, you're following God, and you have one bad day, and you think it's over. But it's not over, because we live in time and seasons. Time is under the sun, seasons are above the sun. And we need to realize that our life is not just based on time, it's based on seasons. And we're going to live in seasons, not in time, when Jesus comes back. And so we need to be ready for that. And the best way I can explain this to you is that, that, that sometimes you can go through a hard situation. So like, for example, we went down to Cape Town. And while we were in Cape Town, we took off at early afternoon and the sun was out and it was a beautiful day. And we started to fly and we went above. And while we were flying, everything was peaceful above the clouds. And we came into Joburg International, O.R. Tamba, and we started to land. There was a storm going on and the plane was shaking and we were holding our breath. And things weren't so well. There was lightning. There was thunder. The pie, everybody on the plane was nervous. We landed on the, on the runway. The storm was still going on. It was a bad storm. But above it, there was peace. Just because you're going through a bad storm, just because you're going through a difficult time right now, it doesn't mean it's a bad season in life. And I really believe that the enemy really tries to confuse us with time. You see, because in time, listen, in time we think it's over. But above the sun, you need to know this, above the sun, you have won. Above the sun, the battle has been won. So the enemy wants you to focus on time. Because if you focus on time and you have a bad day and you mess up, or you slip up or you fail, he makes you think your time is over. But it's not. Because above the clouds, above the sun, the victory has been won. The devil has been made a show, been a show of him has been made openly. Jesus defeated him and the season is a good season. That's why you and I as Christ followers have every reason to wake up with the joy of the Lord. When there is a storm, because the storm is in time, but the season determines my destiny. And so I want to encourage us not get discouraged in things. And time, the, what we need to know is that time change, in time cha things change. Everything changes in time. The Bible says there's a time for sowing. There's a time for reaping. There's a time for laughter. There's a time for crying. There's a time for peace. There's a time for war. Everything changes. Things change in time. People change in time. You can have relationships today that are so close. In 15, 20 years time, those relationships may not be in your life. Everything changes in time. Time is like a pendulum. Political powers change in time. Economic situations and climates change in time. In 28, 20, 20, like 2005, 2006, nobody thought there would be a global recession. Everybody was buying. Everybody was investing. 2008, recession. Let me just tell you right now, things might be tough right now in your life, but it's time. And time does this. It goes from one point to another point. Don't get stuck in time. Start thinking about the season that God is calling you to live in, prepared your life for. Because when we do that, everything changes. Everything changes in time, but what happens above time, what happens above the sun, sun is eternal and lasts forever. And so this morning, I hope this is helping you. And because if you just look at your life through time, you're going to get discouraged. You've got to look at your life through season. You've got to throw everything that you're facing right now. You've got to look at your difficulties that you're facing right now, challenges or failures that you've been through. You need to take it and you need to throw it above the clouds. And when you throw it above the clouds, you're going to realize it just falls into a big season and the season's okay. Because we get so caught up on the season, the time that we're in, we lose focus of the season. Everything changes in time. Look at your life through seasons. Look at your life knowing that you have won because God is on your side. You know, time is here and now. 
here and now we are in time some of you are looking at the time of when the servant's going to be finished we're living in time right now but you know what a great team never looks at the time here and now so like a great football team like man united let me tell you what they do they look at the season they want to win at the end of the season and so while you're living in time we plan to be a success in time. If you had to say to a team that you're going to lose three games in this season, you're going to have some pain, you're going to have some injury, you're going to have some disappointments, you're going to get some people that are not able to go with you the distance because of injuries, but you say, then those are going to happen, but you're going to win the season. What, what would you say? No, no, I don't want to, I don't want to get injured. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to lose this game this weekend. No, you want to win the championship. And so that's how we've got to see our life. Because let me tell you, right now, as we live our life, we're going to have some pain. There's going to be some injuries. There are going to be some people who hurt you. There's going to be some people that let you down. There are going to be some scars. There's going to be some battle wounds. We can't allow that to determine what we're going to do tomorrow, why we're going to live our life for the future, because while we're living in time, we've got to live with the season mindset. And so as we do that, we realize that Jesus, our champion, has won the season. He won. We are victorious because of who He is. Amen. Everything changes. And for you and I, we might face all sorts of battles. And listen, you might feel like you're not making it. And this is what I want you to know. The enemy works in time. He doesn't work in seasons. Because he was defeated in the season. But he works in time. So what he tries to do is he tries to trip you up in time. So you make a mistake in time, he tells you it's over. You, you don't do what God is asking you to do. Maybe you're trying to live for God. You make a mistake and you, you just can't get it right. Something bad happens in your life. You know what he says? It's over. You can't do it. Time is, you don't have enough time to live for God anymore. You're getting too old right now. You've sinned too many times. You've made too many mistakes. And so he tries to make you think that in time you've been disqualified. But you haven't because God is on your side. Because listen, what happens in time, he makes us believe, because this is so true, what happens in time really impacts our eternity. And so we do want to make wise decisions in time. And as we're trying to make wise decisions, things might happen in our life. And so we've got to be focused on God. And just because you've lost a few battles and you've experienced some pain and hurts, and you've got some disappointment in your life, it's time to get up. It's time to wash yourself. It's time to put on the cloak of righteousness. It's time for you to start thinking like a king's kid. It's time to realize that time disappointment happens, and it's time to get ready for the season that God is calling you into, because that season is a glorious season. That season is a season where Jesus defeated the enemy because the enemy wants to lie to you, because he works in time. And so this morning, I want to just talk a little bit about living for the season, because the purpose of the enemy Listen, John 10.10 10 says, the purpose of the enemy is to steal, kill, destroy. That's what he's doing. God's purpose, Jesus, is to come give you life and life more abundantly. Life to the fullest. And so we've got to know the nature of our God and we've got to know the nature of our enemy. The nature of our enemy is this, is that he's a deceiver. That he's a liar and he's an accuser. That's who he is. Who's Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God, the truth, the way, and the life. And so the enemy will try and deceive you. You see, he deceive you by questioning God's authority while you're in time. Because when you go through difficult things, what do you do? You question, where is God? And so he starts to question you while you're in time. And what does he try and do? He tries to deceive you. He says, you know what? You don't have to do that. Being a Christian is supposed to be so exciting. And you're facing serving God, you're working, living for the things of God, you're putting God first, you can't go out of those parties anymore, you can't do all those things that you used to do, how boring is your life? And he tries to deceive you and he says, you know what, you can, you can. Did God really say you shouldn't have fun? God never ever said that. God never ever, in fact, God said you should be full of the joy of the Lord. This is exactly what he did. He questioned God's authority with Eve in the garden. And he tried to deceive her, he said, Eve... Did God really say? And then she said, no, no, God said we should, can eat of any tree in the garden except for one tree. 
Why can't you eat of that tree? God doesn't want you to be like him. God doesn't want you to have knowledge like him. God doesn't want you to think like him. God's trying to protect, hide something from you. God's trying to spoil your fun. He tries to deceive. That's what he tries to do. Why, does, why don't you want to go there? Well, you can go to that party. You can do those things that they do. You can be like those people. Don't, God is just trying to mess up your fun. God will still love you because he's a merciful God and he's a gracious God. That's what he says. He tries to deceive. But little did Eve know that she would have already been created in the image of God. And you know what? He doesn't tell us who we are. He tells us what God doesn't want us to do. And so he deceives us. And then you know what starts to happen? We buy into that deception. Well, I can do this. I can get on the edge of the line. And church on a Sunday and the world on, a, on Monday to Saturday. And you, and, you, and you walk on this line. And you're like, ah, oh, this is cool, man. I'm, I'm living both on church. I'm in church on Sunday. And I'm living on the line. Tries to deceive us. Do you know what happens when we buy into that deception? You know what he does? His nature escalates. He becomes the liar. And then he starts to lie to you about the decision you just made. And he says, you see now, you made that decision. God will never love you. You shouldn't have done that. You're no good to God. He deceived you to do it. Now he lies to you. God, you can't get over this. You can't work through this. Your life is over. You're trying to live holy for God, but you're just like your family. You'll never change. You'll always have that problem. You'll always have that addiction. Come on, you just need to do it one more time. He says to you, you'll feel good. You'll have peace. And then when you do it, he says, how can you come to church? You can't lift your hands in church on a Sunday. You can't praise God. Everybody in the room knows what you've done. He lies to you because that's who he is. He does not know how to tell the truth. So all he does is he lies to you. You're not good enough right now. You're not the one that God wants to use because of what you've done. All because he sold you a deception. Then after he's lied to you, you know what he starts to do? He starts to accuse you. And he doesn't accuse you, he goes to God and he accuses you in the presence of God. And he says, God, you, you can't use that person because of what they've done. And he starts to accuse and he starts to, to bring deception and lies into this situation. Look what Revelation 12 says. It says, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. That's what the enemy does. He tries to accuse us. But this is what you need to know. In time he accuses us, but in season he's been thrown out and no longer accuses us. And we need to realize that God is on our side, living the time, living the season that we're in. He'll, he'll lie to you about who you are because he's the father of all lies. He's, the, he's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's an accuser. But who's Jesus? Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the one who loved the world so much that he gave his only life. Jesus is the rescue agent. Jesus said this. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying, the enemy is a liar. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. But I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. I'm the one who's going to get you to where you need to go to. When you fall in time, follow me. I am the way. When you're feeling discouraged, I'm going to tell you the truth of who you really are. When you feel like the enemy's accusing you, I have defeated him openly and destroyed him. You need to know this morning, church, you might be going through a rough time and the enemy might be lying to you right now, but Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. I'm the only one who can restore, bring healing, bring restoration into your life. And so we realize that he lies to us. Jesus, who is Jesus? He's the truth. So when you sin, when you fall, and you mess up in time, Jesus doesn't come and condemn. He forgives. He restores. He strengthens so you don't have to go back. He shows you the way to avoid the way of deception, to avoid the liar, to avoid the cure. He, the accuser, cure. He, he does all of that. In our lives. Why? Because he loves us so much. Look what Jesus is. Jesus is the advocate. An advocate is somebody who pleads another's case. He stands in the gap on behalf of somebody trying to prove that that person is not guilty. Jesus is our advocate. Enemy is a liar. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus sitting right next to God. This is what you need to know. Jesus is sitting right next to God. And every time... As they're sitting on their throne, watching everything, making intercession, Jesus is praying for you right now. You need to know that. Jesus is praying that the enemy would not sift you like sand. 
enemy's praying that you would, Jesus is praying that you would live the life that God's called you to. And you know what? As we live our life in time, we make some bad decisions. Come on, we all do. And as we make those bad decisions, try guess who comes into the presence of God? The accuser. And the accuser says, look at Donovan. He did this this week. You want to use him to preach. You can't use him to preach. He's done some bad things. He overtook somebody at 140 k's an hour. He spoke ugly to his wife. He did this to his children. He thought these thoughts in his mind. You can't use him. He, he, he is bad. He is like sin. You can't use him. You are a righteous God. You are a holy God. You can never use him ever again. And he accuses and he accuses and he accuses. But you know what happens? God looks at Jesus and he says to Jesus, show me the hands. Show me the holes show me the piercings show me the stripes and he looks at the enemy and he says you are accusing him and that may be all true but my son Jesus paid the price for his sin and he is set free he is the righteousness you're trying to condemn him in time but I've called him to a season and so often in our lives, we get so caught up because we mess up in time. And this morning, you might be thinking, you know what, I've wasted time. I've messed up in time. You need to know you may have done that up until this now point, this point right now. But right now, you can make a decision in your heart that I'm not going to be focused just on time. I'm going to focus on the season that God is calling me into. And when you start to do that, God is able to do great things. If you may have messed, listen, you may have messed up in time, but the season is not over. The season's not over until God says it's over. And I want to encourage people because I think sometimes in our walk with God, the enemy tries to beat us up. I'm not giving him any airtime that he deserves. I'm just stating the fact that he lies, he deceives, and he accuses us. And we as Christ followers need to realize that while we're living in time, that's going to happen all the time. We've got to look above the sun and live with a heavenly mindset. Got to realize that we are more than conquerors. When the enemy comes, he lies, he deceives, he accuses. Jesus is pleading our case. You see, God is the God of time, but he's also the God of seasons. And I want to encourage us this morning, let's be strong in the Lord. So what do we need to do as we get ready to close up? What do we need to do as we live in, in time? Because we have to protect ourselves from the same things over and over. So Proverbs 4, 23 says this, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So, so what this word of God is saying is, is that yes, we're going to live in time and we're going to have some challenges and we're going to be in a season where we've won but while we're living in time this is what you got to do you got to guard your heart and the word guard there is the hebrew word shama it means to keep to have charge of to watch protect it to set boundaries around it, it says as we live in time there need to be some boundaries around our heart and whenever the bible speaks about heart it's speaking about our spiritual life speaking about our spiritual life which impacts our natural life and so what we got to do is we got to put some boundaries around our spiritual life meaning that there's some things that we're not going to do because whatever i do it's going to flow through my life so while i'm living on earth when god says i I don't want you to live this kind of a life, not because I don't want you to have fun, because I know what the enemy is going to do to you. He's going to deceive you and he's going to think it's, you're going to make you think it's fun. He's going to make you think there's a tablet that you need to get peace. He's going to make you think that you need to drink a bottle so that you can have some rest in your life. He's going to make you think that you need to do this to be loved and feel loved, but you'll always feel hollow. So what God is saying, put some boundaries around your heart. Protect it. Protect your heart. Put some boundaries because out of your heart flows everything. So flows everything. So, so, so come on, this is quite scary because Jesus once in the Bible, he said many times in the Bible he spoke, but this one time when he spoke, he had this conversation with his disciples and he started speaking about the heart. And he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, out of the heart. All of those things out of the heart. You would think, listen, listen, you would think those are natural things that happen. But Jesus says, no, it's the heart. So we're going to put some boundaries around our heart. Like some boundaries. When, when the enemy says, you need to do this to make more money, 
You put a boundary that says, no, no, I'm going to live righteously and upright when it comes to my finances. Come on. When the enemy starts to, to put some greedy thoughts in your heart, you know what you're going to do? You're going to change. You're going to put a boundary around your heart and say, instead of being greedy, I'm going to start giving. Instead of slandering, I'm going to start speaking life. Because that's how you build boundaries. And all of us need to have boundaries around our heart. Because without boundaries, we go to ruin. You see, without boundaries, in the Bible, boundaries speak about protection. It allows things in and allows things out. You see, when we don't have a boundary around our heart, the enemy has access. But the minute you have a boundary, he sees the walls. And he doesn't attack. Was this helping someone this morning? I know you want to hear a you ha see me sweat, jump, and do all of that. But I really feel this is like God's discipling us. To put some boundaries around. Not everything that looks good is good. Not just because everybody, no, listen, just because everybody else is messing around doesn't mean it's right in God's eyes. Come on. Just because other people are offering bribes and, no, 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 we've got to put boundaries around our hearts. Why? Because everything flows from our heart. And if our heart is unprotected, the enemy can come in, have his way, and deceive you, lie to you, and ultimately destroy you. But what we want to do is we want to go to God. Maybe your heart's been damaged. Because in time, bad things happen. In time, we get hurt. In time, we get rejected. In time, we lose loved ones and so God is the only one the only one who can take a damaged heart only God no drug no alcohol no sex no amount of money no amount of psychiatric treatment that might, that might help but only God only God because he created the heart and God can take a broken heart and he can restore it. God can take a stony heart and he can make it soft. God can take a heart that's been shredded and he can give it a brand new heart. Only God. And that's why we need to guard our hearts. So we open to God. Because listen, if you guard your heart, that's the key of the whole sermon. If you guard your heart, you won't need to worry about when he's coming your heart will be ready come on he places eternity in the heart of every one of us so this morning i don't know what's happened in your time don't know but i know god knows i know god knows because he knows all things about all men nothing lays hidden from the eyes of god and so maybe today your heart's been damaged. Maybe your heart's been hurt. Maybe your heart's feeling rejected. Maybe your heart feels like it's wandering. Maybe your heart feels like it has no direction. You need to go to the one who knows the heart. You need to go to him and ask him, Lord, I need you to do a work in my heart. How do you know when God needs to do your work in your heart? It's very simple. I saw it in my own life this week. Is when I behave in a way contrary to the way he wants me to live. Simple as that. When I do things that don't line up with what he wants me to live, what's going to be good for me? And I need God to do a work in my heart. And I believe many men and women in this room, we need to ask God, God, would you do a work in my heart? And you know what I love about our God? Is anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That he never turns a deaf ear or a blind eye to the cry of his people. And so right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask you, this is not a salvation call. This is not an altar call. This is just a call to ask people in this room. You've identified that as you live in time under the sun, there's been battles, there's been hardships, there's been situations, incidents, moments, good moments, good times, but there's also been some hard times. And often those hard times kind of define us. Today, God doesn't want that to define you. And you'd say, right now, I need God just to, to do something in my heart. I've got hurt. I've got some unforgiveness. I've got some questions. I'm not trying to say that you need to understand it all. God's bigger than that. This is not a saying, do you know the path forward? That's not what I'm asking. 
Because some of us, we may not know the path forward, but when we give it to God, He might reveal the path forward. And you'd say, you know what, I've identified some things in my heart. Maybe I'm angry. Maybe I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. Maybe I, I've, 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 I just feel like I need more. These are elements of greed or whatever it is. We all have something. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's a sense of pride, of power. You say, God, I need you to do work in my heart. I need to put these boundaries around my heart. If that's you this morning, I want to count two, three. If that's you, just raise your hand. And I'm going to say a prayer for our church. One, two, three. The hands going up. You identify these things. God, I pray right now for each and every man, every woman who has their hand raised right now. Father God, I pray right now, Lord, that we would live for you, Father. That you would give us the strength and the courage, Lord, just to identify these issues in our heart. And just as we have right now, God, we give them over to you. We give these fears over to you. We give these concerns over to you. We give this worry. Whatever it is in our heart, Lord. Father God, I pray that you would just purify our hearts, Lord. Strengthen our hearts. As David said, search our heart, O God, and create in me a clean heart and new heart. So God, right now, I thank you that you are the great physician, the surgeon, and that you're working in hearts, working in lives, working in situations. And Lord, that you're renewing us, restrengthening us, reviving us, restoring us, rehabilitating dreams, hopes, and aspirations. Right now, I thank you, Lord, that you are the only one who can heal. You're the only one who can restore. And so we put our hope and our trust in you right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that we're living with a healthy heart, with the breath of God in our hearts, in our lives. So pray right now by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you would breathe upon every heart, every situation right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God a great hand. Amen. As we close off our service, I want to just extend an invitation to men and women in the room. The greatest, the greatest decision that we could ever make with our life is not what we plan to do under the sun. The greatest decision that we can make is to make sure that our lives are right with God above the clouds, above the sun. And so the only way that our lives ever can ever be right with God is not through human effort, it's not through human wisdom, human intellect, human power, human understanding. It's not that. There's only one thing that makes our hearts right with God. And that's accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, as our Lord and Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. No one comes to God. Jesus is very clear. No one comes to God except through Jesus. It's not through anyone else. It's only through Jesus. And tonight, today, you would say to me, Donovan, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I don't have that personal relationship with Him. I want to tell you right now, you can make that decision in time right now. And it will change your whole season. And so I want to ask every person, bow their heads, close their eyes right now. And if that's you this morning, you need to know that you have a God who loves you. A God who desires that none of us would perish, none of us would be separated from Him. None of us would be absent in His kingdom. But every one of us would be a part of his kingdom. He's building a home for every single one of us in this room. And so right now you'd say, you know, Donovan, I don't know my Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And today I want to make that decision. Today I want to get my life right with God. Most important decision of your whole life is to make sure you're living right with God. That Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Heaven and earth are real places. Earth is where we live. Heaven is the place that God is destined. The truth is this, is that heaven is the place for people who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, hell is a reality. People don't like to talk about it. People don't like to engage in conversation, and we're not going to do that right now. But what we're going to say is that hell is a reality, just like heaven is a reality. And hell was never planned for any person to go. It was never God's plan. But because people reject Jesus Christ... They don't get to see a life in heaven with God. And today you can change that. You can say, you know what? I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to have a relationship with Him. You see, God is about relationship, not about do's and don'ts. And so I want to count to three. And you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. On the count of three, just raise your hand where you are. One, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His Son. You need to know that today God loves you with an unconditional love. He loves you more than you'll ever know. 
to whatever's happened in your past, whatever's happened in time, whatever's happened in time, whether it's good or bad, is insignificant right now. It doesn't determine your future. What determines your future right now is would you say, God, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. You see, God loves you, unconditional love. And so maybe there's things that have happened in your past that you're not proud of. Maybe there's things that you would never want to share with anybody because of what's happened. That's okay. You need to know even because you don't want to share that, you don't need to share that, but that doesn't change God's love for you. He loves you with an unconditional love. Three right now, if that's you, and say, yeah, I want to receive Jesus. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep your hands up high wherever you are. We want to count you in on this. Thank you. I see your hands going up right now. Anybody else that would say, yes, that's me. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You can put your hands down right now. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Maybe in the room this morning, and you'd say to me, Donovan, I used to follow God. I used to serve Him. I used to be committed. I used to be keep watch. I used to guard my heart. I used to be on fire for God. I used to serve Him with all my heart. And, and so there was such a fire and a passion in my heart. But time happened. Things changed. Situations came. And I found myself far from God today. I found myself distant from God. You need to know God is a loving God waiting for you to come back. His arms are open waiting looking for you to say today is the day you can come home will it be the day that you come home and you say you know what i need to recommit my heart i need to recommit my life i feel like that prodigal son i went out and i just was worse off but now i want to come home into my master's house if that's you you say i want to recommit my heart right now just raise your hand and i want to include you in that prayer thank you thank you just keep your hands up we want to just identify where you are say yeah that's me Right now, thank you, thank you. You can put your hands down. If you raised your hand, I want to ask you, on any one of those occasions, won't you repeat this prayer out aloud with me? We're going to pray together as a church. Church, won't you please pray aloud as we lead these people. Let's pray together as we lead these people in prayer. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus, who died on the cross for me and has forgiven me of all my sins. Today, Jesus, I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life giving me a new start today I surrender my life and I follow you today thank you for saving me thank you for cleansing me and giving me a new life in Jesus name I pray amen amen come on let's give those people a great hand